you been? I see you've put out a book of reprinted articles. As a fan, I was a bit bummed. All these years and not much new, I guess the bigger disappointment was that the book was marketed in a way to make it seem like a companion piece to Dr. LeVay's Satanic Bible. And as we all know, it was not. Over the years, we've done a lot of business together. Hell, at one point, I produced the bulk of products sold by your highly trained lapdogs and overseers of the COS t-shirt shop. I've even paid you to write the afterword in the original Satanic Bible. Might is right. I've advised you and yours on the joys of printing on demand, for example, YouTube.com, podcasting, and even brought the world of porn to your feet. More than, let's so let's say, an out-of-touch old man who works for the ultra-lame playboy. Now, I'm not looking for a gentlemanly thank you, nor am I looking for credit where credit's due. Just pointing out that we've done a lot together, and I've given as much as you, so I feel like we're even in that respect, and I owe you nothing. I do, on the other hand, believe that I'm at least owed the common courtesy of an email telling me what you seem to have no problem telling others behind my back. Why tell outsiders, media, non-members, that I'm no longer affiliated with the COS and not tell me? It makes me look bad. Like, I lie about being someone's friend? Most who know me know I have no problem speaking my mind. And I definitely have zero issues with taking an enemy. So, why would you try and paint me as some desperate schmuck who would just cling to a group that doesn't even want me? I'm okay with being fired, but you sort of gotta tell the person being fired, no? And this is where you lack the set of balls that we all assumed you had. Backstabbing and gossip sounds like a weak way of war to me. Maybe, in back in the day, it was a smart way to tear folks apart. But today, in the information age, your truths can and will catch up to you. Me? I live, speak, and breathe my truths? You, I'm afraid your truths are gonna hit you like one ton of lead weight. LeVay may have been your mentor, and he may have taught you a trick or two, but without adapting to the times, you're dead in the water. And from all ends, it looks like you're taking as many as you can down with you. I do hope the few kids you attract look into your truth, and how the most acclaimed, most productive members have little respect with the direction you're trying to force the COS in. And I hope that they see who has turned their back on you, and not the philosophy, not LeVay's words, but you. So, in this open letter, I ask that you either drop me a note telling me to fuck off, or post in public. I don't mind, remember, I never joined. LeVay gave it to me. Proof of this will be in the book I'm working on for an actual old school big ass publisher, Winter 2009. Now, to get to doing what you do best. Push some paper and fire me, cause I ain't quitting. P.S. Remove my copy written interview with Dr. LeVay from your site. The article housed at this URL, churchofsatan.com slash pages slash mfinterview.html. For any interested in the original Satanic Bible, you should look into Midas Right. Here's a link where you can co- download a copy for $1.99. Technology is moving so fast. Every month is equivalent of a year. It smells weak, tastes weak, it's weak. I don't appreciate your slant. I recently met a fella, did an interview, and represented myself in the COS as I always have. Wow, I can't believe I wrote that. I have not read it since 2000. Oh my God, 10 years. I can't believe I wrote that. That's a really good letter. Uh, yeah, uh, wow. I, I, I'm, uh, I have to take in the whole context of that letter, but I, I barely can hear your question. Um, <laughs> so who's is, PNP? <laughs> Peter and Peggy Gilmore. Wow, that pe- I think she shares his name. Uh, Wow. Yeah, that happened. You know, it's funny. 
you know, the first thing that comes to mind with that letter, it's not it has all to do with me, nothing to do with this letter, I guess. But I write those letters to people all the time and I forget about them like I have. And then I try to contact those people again, like, hey, this is going on or whatever. And they don't write me back. And I was like, what the fuck did I do to them? And then I'm reminded by someone will say, hey, do you remember that letter you wrote them? Remember that shit you said to them? I'm like, no, not really. And 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 this is that moment. Because I wrote Peter maybe three or four years ago. And it's not like I'm trying to be friends with them again. Peter Gilmore, Church of Satan head. Uh, I, I'm just writing him out of business. You know, like, you know, like band members, you break up a band and you get a hold of someone for business matters, right? And But he never wrote back. And I'm like, what the fuck is that guy? Can't be professional, write me back. But after you read that letter, man, oh man. Wow, no wonder. Man, I... I Wow, no wonder that motherfucker hates me. I don't take a word of it back, though. I mean, uh, like, some of this... Uh, it, this is like Shane Bugby's cut of No Vaseline. This is this is rough. This is, this is a punch. And, you know, I wasn't there, and I can feel the anger, the heat coming off of this. That all happened after six 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 Eve. When that when we when the Church of Satan split, it split hard, and that's part of the that's part of one of those reverberations or the ripples in the pond. Um, wow, I, I, Shane of yesteryear, Shane of ten years ago. I want to shake your hand. <laughs> I think that letter was very good. I I can't say I would write the same one today, but I can't say I wouldn't. I probably would just send it on a podcast. I wouldn't even write it. So, wow. so the I'm con- so sorry. I'm 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 so impressed with myself right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm I'm glad. I'm glad that I could experience this year <laughs> with you. <laughs> you know what? I've been writing a letter like that to Doogie. Uh, like I said, I was going to write an open letter to him, and it's very. Very no Vaseline, but go, let's, let's, well, no, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I'm not sorry. Sorry, not sorry. But wow, that was a shocker to hear. When I sent you these letters, I didn't read any of them. I just like, boom, just started sending you materials. Boom, 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 boom. And I was like, I like to be incriminated. Like, let me incriminate myself. Let's find out what's going on here. Boom. I dropped it. Holy shit. Okay. I'm so sorry. I won't say anything else. This podcast is based around the history and experiences of the infamous Shane Bugby, recollected and retold by Shane Bugby himself. Who is Shane? Well, you're about to find out. I'm your host, Nanarol, and this is Speak of the Devil. Welcome to our final episode of Season 1 of Speak of the Devil podcast. I'm your host, Nanarol, and I just read to you the open letter written to Peter and Peggy Gilmore, written by Shane Bugby and published on his MySpace back when MySpace was around. So was this the only place you posted it and you just posted it for the world to see? Yeah, it may have been posted on my personal website. Mm -hmm. I'm not... It, that would not have mattered because once social media came into play, websites sort of phased away. You know, it, MySpace was it. It was a big deal. It was viral on MySpace. It was a big deal. Oh, yeah. So for those who have popped into our wonderful podcast and have decided to learn more about Shane but don't know much about Church of Satan, who is Peter? Well, Peter Gilmore... I, I I often I still wonder who Peter Gilmore is, <laughs> but but he's a he was a he was not accomplished, but he took over for for Anton Levey. The rumor had it that he bought the Church of Satan, or funded it somehow some way where Levey really appreciated him. Perhaps, I'm not sure. Perhaps like a college student who got in because his parents bought a wing. Right, exactly. And that's what it seems to be. But to speak that stuff, a lot of people see that as being derogatory to Anton LeVay. 
Dr. LeVay because, you know, people want to protect his legacy. They want to say he died in, you know, broke. And, and so, because that doesn't represent, people think that that doesn't represent a philosophy. Well, like the same way they treat Ayn Rand. Well, she took, uh, health care for, you know, whatever government assistance at the end. And, and that's such a ridiculous concept to me that like Anton LaVey could be besmirched. The idea is he's putting forth the philosophy that if it were a reality, he would not have died in poverty. Same with, same with Crowley. Crowley died in poverty as well, or borrowing money from friends and people like, well, what's the magic in that? Mozart died broke. Right. And most of these people are working a gig and they've given up a long, long time ago. And all they do is criticize. But LeVay lived his life till the end as a one percenter. Bikers, criminals, Capone, all of them did so much as free human beings, free as free can be. Every minute of their day, they owned every minute of their day. They owned. Not many people can say that. (laughs) <laughs> but those people are the ones criticizing and making fun of someone that owned every minute of their day. So I have nothing but the ultimate respect for Dr. LeVay and all of the one percenters that I follow in my life. I follow these people and I admire them. But the idea, the, the fact is that LeVay probably had money issues at the end. And he was supported, like many artists are, through patrons. And one of his patrons was probably Peter Gilmore. And Peter has reaped the benefits of that by being able to take over the Church of Satan. Years later, after that letter, maybe two to five years later, you'll have to excuse me, kids, but I did my youth right. And I don't remember much of the timeline. It's a blur. But Boyd Rice put out a letter basically saying that LeVay wanted him to take over the Church of Satan. That was his want, but Peter was able to leverage whatever help he gave to get the Church of Satan. And Boyd would have made a more realistic leader after Anton LeVay. LeVay really liked Boyd Rice. I hated Boyd Rice myself. I think he's a prick. Um, uh, real, real crybaby, another rich kid. He, um, he reminds me of another, another similar <laughs> person. <laughs> right. And that's usually how people rose to the ranks and rise to the ranks in a lot of these groups. I know a lot of the older people before the new wave of uh, LeVay, you know, like hierarchy before myself, like uh, the, the original Church of Satan people, they didn't have a lot of respect for anyone who joined up in LeVay's uh, final moments, fi- you know, final 10 or 20, 15 years, 40, 50. Yeah. So final 15 years, they didn't have much respect for because a lot of people were buying their way in, buying, you know, give them a thousand bucks, being able to visit the house. And before that, it was not about money. It, well, you know, it was about forming this, you know, this, this philosophy. It's interesting so, that he- these people almost seem to have preyed upon LeVay's weaknesses by buying their way in, sort of like, you know, getting getting the yes out of a tired or sick parent. I never saw LeVay as weak, tired, or sick. I saw him as a gypsy at the lead, like, and I, I don't say that word in a derogatory no, m- manner. No, no, he's a magician. I it, right, I see it as a, he was a crystal ball reader. So you were, it would not have mattered if he stroked out And couldn't talk and was drooling on himself. You were always in his web. When you came into the room, he would be able to play on your sympathies and get what he wanted. You're never going to walk out of the room without giving him a... uh, If he were stroked out, barely able to function, you would always give him his pudding cup. You would always be in his web. He was a really great magician. So... It seems that way for, for observers, but everyone served him and his, his, his end, you know, what his goals were. And his goals at the end were very simple. Go out for steak once a week, went to a nice steakhouse, had, made sure he had his wine, he had food. You know, he was able to play his piano. The lights were on. 
I don't know. As an artist, I don't need a mansion to prove my success to anyone. I'm not proving my success to the general public. I don't care what they think, but I do care that my lights are on. I have art supplies. I'm fed. I'm able to get around without stressing. And I have patrons that take care of me like that to a degree, to a small degree. I could use more. I could use a lot more. But but it's like uh, as long as I have coffee and, and I'm able to get like a uh, Lem's barbecue once in a month or something like that, like a treat, I'm, I'm pretty good. And I think LaVey had that same simple, simple joy system. You know, you know, joy can be pretty simple. It doesn't have to be based on everyone else's interpretation of what success is. Right. That's quite a relatable lifestyle. I go to the same restaurant once every week and. I have to make sure that my instruments work and I can play on them and drink my coffee. That's, that's very much me as well. So I have so much respect for that. And whatever you had to do within your magic to get there, that is your magic. That's not other people's magic. And he didn't do it for anyone but himself. Right. So as an artist, you relate, you relate yes. with these simple things, make you joy are, are, are pleasurable and your, your accomplishments are yours. It doesn't yes. matter how everyone else sees it. Is, is that it? Yes, absolutely. And your struggle with your craft being better. That's yours. Yes. It's your, your, your competition is with yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's what great artists. I feel like I, that's how I feel about it. Like when other one get, gets involved in, it, I'm like, Oh, you're gross, man. I don't even want, like, what causes me to want to be a recluse is that kind of crap. Like, because I've done something and you know me, like, you don't know me, but you know my name or you know something I've done, you feel the need to criticize me or whatever. Like, man, I just want to play in the sandbox with you. I don't want to sit here and have sand thrown at me, you fucking dick. You know, and that's how I felt about, like, people were trying to kick sand in LeVay's face and... He was just, you weren't able to, he was just, a, he was, he was really cool. And so Eddie, you know, we're talking about Peter and Peggy though. It's easy to forget about them and talk about Anton LaVey. That's the real, that's the real issue here. Like it's so easy not to talk about Peter Gilmore and just go right to Anton LaVey. It's like, he doesn't matter. He ma- he, he created an identity for himself. Peter didn't put out a record or a CD for his music until well after LeVay was dead and, and when most of the older group like myself was like, you're unaccomplished. How dare you even say anything to me or tell me how to act online or dictate what the, what, what I'm going to do. LeVay made me a fucking reverend, made, made me a priest. Fuck you, dude. Like you don't have anything. You didn't do what I did. So that's what it became down, came down to is like, no one really had respect for Peter so the older people like Boyd Rice, myself, other people, we sort of got shuffled off and Peter just took people who would, you know, most of the ilk that I've saw join up were like putting out B grade, C grade stuff, you know, and I don't want to put them down because they're trying, you know, effort is a big deal to me. No, but like, writing on the clout of I'm a Satanist rather than writing on the clout of their achievements and the and being a Satanist. Yeah, or just writing on the clout of their experience in life and it becoming, it is satanic in and of itself. Like, I created this artwork and it is satanic. It is fucking from the black flame. It is within, you know, that is, that's where, that's where art, you know, like, like, I don't know. Your accomplishment is first, not your Satanism. No, you don't, you don't buy your outfit and then decide you're an artist. You don't grab your right. fucking Hot Topic outfit and decide that I am a Satanist now because I put on this costume. It, yeah, if Peter, it's within you. If it's within you, what were you going to say? Yeah, I, I'm well, sorry. Oh, no, no, that was it. That it's, it's okay, within it's you. Me. There's, there's nothing else about it. You can't buy that identity. Right. And after Peter came in, it became more of a cult it became more cultish. People really followed what he had to say. And man, I was glad to get the ass end of LeVay, man. I was glad to catch that because it was cool. It was everything, 
Uh, man, why isn't a film made about that, LeVay, and, and the end there? That was cool. It was like everything you see in the all these cool scenes, like the Yippies and the Black Panthers. It was freedom. It was it was libertine. It was all of that. It was really cool. The people, I was always excited to meet Satanists because it'd be like they'd be so different. You know, it was just so fucking neat. And then it became all the same. All the fedora, all the same fedora. I think we discussed all the same haircut, all the same, all the same. It became identity, not accomplishment. And so, oh man, yeah, LeVay was cool. And Peter's invisible. When you when you know who LeVay is, these, I don't know, it becomes sort of like, it, the, I don't know what to say about Peter and Peggy, you know. Peggy, Peggy was criticized. I remember back in the day for working a job at UPS and people like, if she's magic, uh, that's not, you know, and I, I never felt she defended herself. Right. You know, like there's nothing necessarily wrong with working a gig and, and being a Satanist, you know, it, it's your choice. I think though, if you're going to run a group, you should have some great artistic accomplishment when the group is based in art and science, the, 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 the lace philosophy isn't based in, hard work for other people it's hard work for yourself so where's peggy's book where's peggy's music where's peggy's paintings where's peggy's anything but consuming fucking trader joe's peanut butter okay where is it and that's what offends me mostly about peter and peggy like where are their accomplishments that they're going to talk to accomplished people because uh, because i like to i'm from chicago we're an eye-to-eye -eye culture but you, 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 you don't get to look down on me. And that's how they are. They look down. They have attitude. And, 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 and uh, attitude and Satanism without accomplishment is bullshit. I think it's sort of one of those uh, crabs in the pot <sighs> incidences because you were the last person appointed a high priest by LaVey. But you were also, you didn't pursue COS. COS invited you, and that is enigmatic, and that's beyond rare, I feel like, in this day and age. And so the fact that people are looking for groups to join, and they wanted you part of a club that you were reluctant about initially, gives you so much more cool points than Mr. Gilmore. And it's so painfully obvious as a third person that he wanted to erase you because you threatened him. Yeah, because I'm, a, and I don't mean to brag, but I'm like the real deal. That's the truth of the matter. Because, and I'll say, explain it like this like, LeVay was a fucking fry cook. He fried burgers for people, so he wasn't above working. He, he, you, but he, when he was working frying burgers, he was Anton LaVey still. And he was looking and studying humanity and coming up with his philosophy. And every moment, moment of his life, every burger he's fried, he looked at this person he served. He goes, Hey, what kind of salad dressing are you using? And he took his notes. You taking that salad dressing? And he took his notes. And he took his notes. And he came up with this philosophy. And so LaVey. As I, I think I've said this before, but no, no point, no, no reason not to reiterate it. Like the genius is coming up with a really a, a simple statement for a very complex thing, a very complex study. And LeVay was able to do that. Peter is not. If you read his writing, it's awful. It's like, oh, God, I'm sleeping, dude. It's it's this intellectual masturbation that I fucking despise. And it, it, it's like, if you can't talk to the short order cook, you are an elitist pig. Fuck yes. you. you. You can be intelligent and have gone to Harvard or gone to these places. But if you cannot get it across to the juggalos, and I'm in love with juggalos. I'm whoop in love whoop. with. Yeah, whoop, whoop. So I don't say that derogatory, but you know as well as I do, juggalo. You know, we working with box cutters down here, not not sam not swords, not samurai swords or whatever Peter's wielding. We're working with box cutters, razor blades, and so, um, and we can cut just as deep though. Uh, if you can't communicate to the juggalos and all the, all the the fry cooks, fuck you. Anton Lavey had the gift of speaking to the common man. 
he could speak to anybody. He was a shapeshifter in way he ways he could speak, and Gilmore, unfortunately, has perpetuated the edge lord stereotype that unfortunately COS has, and you know I say this as a non COS that every footage of him. I do not see a leader. I see, ooh, I am the spoopy devil guy. Versus Levey. Yes, there's a little camp involved with Levey, but at the same time, it's commanding. It doesn't matter. He could have had sparkles on his fucking face. The character he had, the when he was as Levey, as Anton, he commanded attention and he forced people to listen to him. He knew the art of power. He knew the art of power moves, not just look at me. I bought my way up to the top. I'm a social climbing person. You know, it, he was, he was a fry cook for himself and look what he did after he was a fry cook. Yeah. You can't buy those experiences. No, you can't. You cannot buy those experiences, that hard work, all that grease. I have to ask to devolve the the, the conversation for a moment yeah. for you to explain what an edgelord is to old folks like myself. I sort of understand it, but I, I you know. So an edgelord is someone who needs to one up a conversation or a situation to basically be on the extreme, con either a contrary side, or they have to choose the most shocking thing to make themselves sound interesting, because without showing that edge, they are not interesting people. They have, they are essentially wet carrots that have, you know, some sort of pepper or vinegar just rolled around on them. But if you wash that vinegar off, they're just a wet carrot. I, I fucking don't like edgelords with that. I don't like them. I don't like edgelords. That's all I know after that description. I thought it was going to be something about obscenity or something cool that I might be able to go, well, I could see. But yeah, yeah. And Peter is like an edgelord. But there's a difference and, between an edgelord and an extreme person, because I wouldn't call Shane Bugby an edgelord. Shane Bugby is extreme. Shane Bugby is obscene. Shane Bugby did not hold back. But also, Shane Bugby's self expression was not to get girls to drop their panties or to pander to people who need a cult to belong to. And he never did these things to control other people. He did these things to survive as an artist. And to expose, you know, his soul, expose his beliefs as an artist. Yeah, I love that. You know, I'm thinking about panties dropping. But but beyond that, I also, like, there's a, there's a path that has dragged me along. There's a magnet in my life. And my interest, I just move forward in it. And then whatever, like I've been told I have a learning disability or I have a savant attitude, whatever. It's like, part of it is I am interpreting what's been given to me by LeVay or by John Sinclair or, 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 uh, Allen Ginsberg, as I sat with him, all of these counterculture people that gave me their time and, and I have these conversations. Well, it's, it's like, um, when they run relay races, culture and the the culture that I exist in is like a relay race. I'm bringing this to someone younger and I'm, I'm doing a relay race with you now. That's what I consider this. I take my time and I, I want to give this to you and, and younger people to take it and listen to what I'm saying and go, okay. And, and study LeVay or think about what I'm saying or think about what these people have said and move it forward. The more we move this forward, the more freedom we have, the more expression we have, the more joy we have in life, the less, the less pain, uh, not to say that pain is not part of life, 
but it most certainly doesn't have to be a day-to-day, five days a week, overworked, underpaid existence. We can care for each other. We don't have to have these weird divides. Self-expression, yeah, uh, the, uh, the path that pulls me along, part of, part of the occult thing is, is understanding how to, how to translate that. And then understanding how to give it back in a tricky way where it's not just like a pen and teller. Here's the information. Because when you give occult information to the wrong people, they can do horrible things with it. They can manipulate people into dropping their panties, let's say. They can manipulate stupid people into doing stupid acts. So there's a reason occult stuff is hard to understand at times when you're looking into these old writings. And there's a reason that when you give it back, you give it back with some tricks or some attitude or, you know, some, some, something for people to disagree with. Cause maybe I disagree with the same things you're disagreeing with. Maybe it's a test. It's like the trickster and the native American, the coyote. Maybe we're doing some coyote tricks, you know, we're doing some trick stuff. It, it you know, I'm, I can ramble on about this, I guess. I don't want to ramble too much. But there's this, this, like I say, there's a magnet that pulls me along. I think it's interesting you use the metaphor about the relay race and passing the baton. I think that true artists teach and true artists pass on the baton because they know that their art has to surpass their, their life. And yeah. to do so, you can't hoard it. You have to pass on what you know. Look at great art throughout history. Everybody studied with or lived alongside or mentored with somebody and grew from that. And they evolved as artists. And I think that what Gilmore is doing is basically coveting this group as the king of the mountain. And it's not going to go anywhere after him. Yes, and I think the idea that they looked at him in a sympathetic way, we need to cover up his ass end, shows the, the intent that they looked at him in a sympathetic way. And a mentorship isn't a sympathetic fucking thing. It is a two-way education. Not only does the elder teach the student, but the student teaches the elder. That's the excitement of fucking dying. As a mentor, you were learning stuff until the end. Life is about learning and, and always studying and always being a fucking student. And a, you can be a student and a teacher all at once. And when you're looking at someone in a sympathetic way like that, you're not a student. You're just the, ma- the puppet master. And it's an intent that is disgusting to me. It's an intent of dictators and rulers and bosses. And I'm no boss and I'm no ruler. I'm just me being drug along this fucking path. Sorry, not sorry, as the kids say now. <laughs> sorry, not sorry. That's one of my favorite sayings present day is sorry, not sorry. I really love it. Hashtag sorry, not sorry, Shane. <laughs> I think that it's quite beautiful that you got an interview with LaVey before he passed away, almost like he passed on a, a piece of his DNA to you before dying and I can't help but feel like he needed to meet you and pass something on to you to keep up the trip and and that's somewhat what LaVey said to me when I left that house that night he thanked me a dozen times he said I needed to I needed to talk about might is right I needed this to be put out because it was a, it was a mark on his history people say he plagiarized it and I thought that at first too until I understood what was going on more as a fully blossomed artist you know you steal and, and it's cool he made something different out of it he took the hate out of it he really did do something different with that book but he he thanked me because that was a that was something that he had not no one had approached him on it was too controversial or amongst the people that had their ill intent it was something they were they were afraid of or they ignored but it was a part of history I was going after and and he thanked me a lot and I was just like dude I thank you 
And he, no, thank you. It was like one of those moments. And that's, as a 50 year old, I could see as I've had a handful of mentors, that's when you're exchanging knowledge. I gave him something, he gave me something. It's a symbiotic fucking thing. It's like that. I didn't just go there and take an interview with him. We, we were intimate. And that's what a decent interview is, is intimacy. It's, it's giving, it's giving and incriminating yourself and, and all of that stuff we had in that moment. It was a real special moment and it was really special for him to thank me. And it's beyond like hearing that letter, it's like hard to like, wow, that's my history, huh? And, and it, I don't like to think about my past. And at this moment, I haven't thought about Anton LaVey thanking me probably since it happened, but that's pretty intense to say some dude like that thanked me because I could feel pretty small at times. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. I feel like I've learned a lot from you, getting to know you as a friend, but also making this podcast. I have tried to sort of fit into your shoes because I know that you used to interview others. You used to hold documentaries and interview for articles. And it's been pretty big shoes for me to fill. And I can't help but consider you my mentor as well. Oh, wow. Well, that's a pretty big deal, too. You're such an accomplished, great artist. Please don't die now that you've passed on your <laughs> your mentorship to me. Please yeah. please be alive at least for two more seasons. Oh, like, th- th- thanks. That two seasons, at, that, what, that, what does that mean? Six weeks? Oh, I, I'd like to be alive into my 80s. I met an 80-year-old guy today mm-hmm. at a bakery. We were buying cannolis. And he comes in. And I go, oh, sir, go right in front of me. He goes, he looks at me and goes, I got all the time in the world. And I look at this motherfucker, he's fucking old. <laughs> and he says that, and I sort of smile at him, and he smiles back and goes, no, really, I've got all the time in the world. And I go, okay. And um, I go, can you explain that to me after I got my cannolis? You got all the time in the world. Tell me about your concept of time. He goes, oh, buddy, I'm retired. I can do anything I want at any time. I got all the time in the world. You know, he's assuming I'm on the clock or someone else up, you know, so he, he has compassion for the working (laughs) stiff and the people around him that are like, you got to rush and get home. Got to take a shot. Not me. I'm going to ride my bike and eat this cannoli. Not, I got all the time in the world. I just, man, I just love that old man. And I go, when I left, I go, I want to live until I'm in my eighties. So I want to say it to people when I'm old and I look decrepit, like, I, don't you dare say any of these kids say I look decrepit right now. You're going to have a problem. Because <laughs> uh, I've had young kids recently in the last six months open doors for me. Sir, can I get the door for you? I'm like, I'll fucking kick you in the shins, you fucking asshole. <laughs> I take it as I'm like, thank you very much, young man. It's so weird to be here, though, because my mind is 25. But... I want to live to be that old man, 80 year old. I got all the time in the world. Cause that's the concept of time at 80 something years old. And to say, I got all the time in the world. Isn't that the truth today? I've got all the time in the world. I'd be dead tomorrow. But right now I've got all the time in the world. I don't know. It's a wild concept. Well, And I take, and I am a happy as I got to know you on Twitter, I am just so happy to share my information with you, your interest. And I, I, I thought, I'll do this before. I thought like you were a secret member of the COS. You're like the supreme artist and all this stuff. So you really understand all of this stuff so well. It's really cool to cool to work with you. And you can talk to the fry cooks. Oh, I was one of them at one time too. And Believe you me, I did it for me, and so should you. I want to thank all of our listeners for listening to this season. Catch us next season when we delve a little more into history of Shane Bugby as well as some of the artists that he brushed elbows with and perhaps some part twos of some of the harder subjects we touched upon. It's been a bumpy ride, but you've held on to the handlebars just fine. 
You can unbuckle your seatbelt now and join us for some cake and boobies in the other room. Yeah, cash me outside. Cash me outside too. How about that? A special thanks comes out to Shane Bugby for sharing his story and his history and being so generous in bringing to justice a lot of story that has been somewhat erased within cyber history, believe it or not. A lot of this podcast, I have to make a special acknowledgement as well to Dr. Anton Zandor LeVay, of course. Without him, we wouldn't have this common bond. However, we will be pencil pals forever. Yes, pencil pals. Thank you for listening. Please subscribe and tune in to our next episode wherever you prefer to listen to podcasts. You can find us at Speak of the Devil Pod on Twitter and contact us at Speak of the Devil Pod at gmail.com. For Shane's artwork or to support his endeavors, please visit shanebugby.com or find him on Twitter at shanebugby. I've been Nanarol. Have a good one. Oh, and Shane is the devil. Dot com.